introduction. In fact, I requested you to cut everything else other than that I'm just from here, from the campus. So thank you everybody. A very good evening to all of you. So following up on what Dr. Rupal presented in the last seminar, I have been very serious in not having any sugar presented today. In fact, I'll talk a little bit about the fiber. There's a lot of cellulose in it. And uh, that's important for our mental health, hopefully for the next 45 minutes to an hour. The title, I feel that some of you had difficulty in pronouncing what's written there or maybe understanding the other part which is the longitudinal study. So let's see what, it's not to attract more speakers, it's actually a very important school of thought in French history. And today's talk I'm going to broadly talk about two important aspects. The first is, what is the long durée? And how can this long durée help us understand the history of cotton, the story of cotton in Vidhav. The second part I'm going to talk about a longitudinal study that I've been running since 2009 and that's also informing the book that you just heard about. When I was 21, I was a master's student and I was hooked on to this place called Vidhav. I saw that there's a lot of negative press about it. Farmers are committing suicides in hordes. There are stories about indebtedness of farmers and we have somehow not figured out why is there a development backlog in this region which comprises 11 districts of a fairly rich, in fact the richest state in the country, Maharashtra. What is going on in that region? So after my masters I worked in the industry for a year designing insurance programs and insurance contracts for farmers across the country and therein I felt that perhaps there's a lack of engagement with more fundamental questions that scholars, researchers, and practitioners ought to ask. In that context, I came back to my alma mater, IGIDR Mumbai, in 2007 and 2008 onwards, I was almost there in campus having left my job. So when I joined the campus, I realized there's, there's already a lot of scholarship that's happened in the place that I was fixated on in my master's thesis, in my last year of master's thesis, which is trying to understand rural indebtedness. Why are farmers poor? Why are farmers not able to get the livelihood stories that we see in other development parts or other developed settings in India as well as elsewhere? What is the structural problem in this region? People everywhere talking about politicians visiting villages, one story in particular that triggered my interest in visiting with her was that of farmers selling off their kidneys. And one more story which is not far from where I saw that story is that farmers have put on their village for sea. I took a train to Vidar. I landed in Varda where Gandhiji was setting up Seva Brahm and in Paris. We realize that what we are taught in the textbooks ought to reflect the reality some way or the other. Having come from a background which is more positivist, I am an economist by training, I do not know what is qualitative research at the age of 22 and 23. I don't understand epistemological positions. I don't understand what is ontology. The moment I landed in the village of Dorli in Vardha district, it's hardly 15 to 16 kilometers from the city center, I asked a rock, why did you sell the village or why did you decide to sell the village? Very interesting narratives emerged. And it is that precise moment I had an epiphany. I realized that I am not equipped well enough 
to get these answers. So in a sense, I was falling in love to a certain extent which seems sadistic in hindsight. That, well, my advisor is saying there is a crisis. My advisor's advisors are saying there is a crisis. Government is saying there is a crisis. The politicians are very busy getting the vote bank sorted out in the regard of the crisis. But what is this crisis after all? At the same time, since I was just putting on a researcher's hat in my first year of PhD, I was also doing a lot of review of literature like many of you have. I realized that the biggest challenge is in understanding how do you conceptualize a crisis. A crisis of what? Is it an agrarian crisis? Is it a crisis of livelihoods? Is it an agricultural crisis? Is it about the state withdrawing from agriculture? Well, we kept hearing a lot about neoliberalism. We say that state is withdrawing, perhaps given the prescriptions of the neoliberal agenda. We also saw very interesting initiatives in the field. In the places I visit, I took the ST buses, all the districts I traveled over that year 2008 to 2009, I came back and I decided that perhaps there is a deficit in my understanding of what the crisis is, what an economist could perhaps make sense of it. It was also around that time that anthropologists like Lynn Davis Stone, they were talking about this process of de-skilling that has set on in the agriculture. What is these scale? Imagine that you are a farmer. For generations you are attuned to producing a crop following certain agronomic practices. All of a sudden, I come in, I change the methods of production. I change the agronomic practices. I recommend some alternatives. You fail to adapt to it. At the same time, you may ask the question, does the failure to adapt to new technologies or agronomic practices necessarily result in crisis and the gory manifestation of the crisis in the form of farmers committing suicides and holes. It is in precisely these broader academic questions that were troubling me, I realized that there are diversity of narratives. There were different camps. One camp is saying technology has triumphed. The other camp is saying technology has failed. So what does a 23 year old researcher do? The easiest thing you could do is, hey, let me start my research in that region. And it is precisely in that background. Today I'm going to talk about why being an economist, I felt the need to engage with economic history. History for us was humanities back then and still today it is humanities. In other words, you feel that having cracked tough entrance exams in the world, in the country, why would you go back to reading something? You perhaps did not like much in school, or you perhaps did not want to associate with, to dilute your pedigree perhaps, in that epistemological sense, in that disciplinary sense, because economists are arrogant. And go back to 2007 and 8, we have a crisis happening in the macro sphere. We're talking about the global financial crisis. But at that point, you feel that there's a distance between you and the crisis. But are you able to connect to the crisis of the farmers, which is not necessarily because of the factors that caused the global financial crisis? So question came up to mind. I said, is the crisis in Vidraga that has attracted me to conduct my research there, considering this as the site of my research, is this crisis recent? The second question that came to mind is, there are historical events happening as we speak. There are historical events that have happened. There is a fundamental distinction between the past and history. I'll briefly talk about it. But if historical events have shaped not only Vidharva, but also the cotton economy of Vidharva, then how do you make sense of it in a proper academic setting? That is the young researcher in me asking that question. And more importantly, what is the time scale that you have to follow? So this is Around the time I was introduced to the work of a French historian who wrote very well, who argued very fluidly. So he is saying that if there is a cause and effect relationship between events in the past and the outcomes in the present, no matter how far you are, somewhere you see that they're all getting connected like a chain if you may think of it. So if you're saying 
that there is a crisis in Vidarbha. Today, perhaps events in the past have influenced why farmers have not adapted to it well or why the adjustments have failed. But how far in the past can you go behind? So in that setting, I try to understand Vidarbha. It may seem a bit surprising that an economist is pouring into archaeological studies to understand what is Vidar. Vidar is a land where dinosaurs have roamed 63 million years back. Vidar is a land where the colonial imagination of Gondwana is there. After all, we grew up in Jungle Book, right? And this part of the region which is bordering Madhya Pradesh is where the setting of Jungle Book is. There are tigers there, there are tribals there, so the colonial imagination is running wild. There are antiquarian references after all. We're talking about the Mahabharat, we're talking about Naladame, and he was talking about Rukmini, who is the daughter of Vidar, and she is that's why called Vaidarvi in the broader literary context, and Shakuntala. So if you like Abhiganam Shakuntalam at some point in your life, then you connect the dots and say, hey, I didn't know that she is associated with this land and going to study. In the political sphere, we know about the Vidar movement to a large extent the movements that were kind of structured around the demands for a separate state of Vidar. If I go on to say to you, what is the political history of Vidar that is relevant to my economic research on cotton and crisis in Vidar, I am lost. I am seeing that these movements date back to as early as the first decade of the 20th century before the Maharashtra state was formed, Ambedkar had this very interesting arguments on what should be the approach to state formation and more interestingly, the state reorganizations committee had in fact given a verdict in favor of separation of Vidar, which for separate political reasons and the pressures from the center did not work out. After all, Nagpur is the winter capital of Maharashtra, we know about it. But at that point, when we are characterizing with that, we forget that there is crisis, there is a kind of issue of farmer suicides that has been engulfing that region at different layers. But you also see, is it that far from Maharashtra and Mumbai in that political imagination? Then the broader climatic settings, we understand this is a region of this <coughs> black shawls and sallow black soil is very good for cotton, it's also called black cotton soil and we see that there are variations within as well as between the parts that consist of the present day with It is in this broader context which I am still engaging in because it is not a binary classification or a binary conceptualization. There are things that I am learning on the go and briefly talk about a few today. So what is the long delay? To the French Annals School, which started off with the setting up of a journal by Lucien Fabre, there's an E missing there, and Mark Blotch in 1929. So they had a very different perspective on writing histories. They say this short term, the short duration histories are not doing justice to our understanding of historical changes. Can we make the duration longer? And this is precisely where historians like Fernand Brodel came in. So Broughton wrote a very important piece while he was imprisoned during the interwar period. He wrote about the Mediterranean and Mediterranean life in the age of Philip II. So lastly talking about the region which is Spain, south of Spain and north of Africa, the Maghreb region and all. So he's saying that Philip II was Philip II not because he was Philip II, but because of the Mediterranean because of the circumstances, because of the forces that acted upon Philip II. Now that was a very important insight for me. If I wanted to understand the crisis in Wither, I would say that this crisis is also largely because of it being played out in Wither. The theater for the crisis is Wither. But is Wither isolated? Has it been isolated in history? Why did cotton grow? Why are farmers not really giving up cotton if there is crisis and so on? So in Broden's conceptualization, there are three temporalities or three layers or levels of time. In the broader layer, which is the longest of the historical dimensions, 
He's talking about the geographical time. We're talking about the river basins, we're talking about mountains, we're talking about the deep geological structures that are changing very slowly. They are interacting with the social systems, with the human systems, and the human environment interactions. That is not the realm of the economics. That is not the realm of the sociologists or the anthropologists, and so on. Then there is a more relatable social time, which is more intermediate. We're talking about 10 years or 15 years or even 20 years of the economic cycles that you can connect to. So that's where you can see these changes in a relatively rapid sense. Even many economists and anthropologists of the time or sociologists did not engage with that sort of a change. So in fact, when Broderick was writing about it, he was venting against the crisis in history. Many of the other disciplines did not want to engage with history. Historians did not want to talk to geographers. Historians did not want to talk to social artists. Or perhaps the other, or the other disciplines did not want to cross the boundaries. So it's written about in, in several interesting pieces. And then lastly, a time that the historians of that era really focused on. Writing about kings, writing about rulers, writing about leaders writing about the individuals. Now that is what is called event history or episodic history, specific events, specific individuals, and so on. So Fernand Goodell and the Annan School, they were largely a critic of this kind of history. They would say, do not write about these individuals, do not write about this, write collectively. So this is a broader setting which I could connect to, and I felt, well, let me have a long theory in my historical understanding of the matter. How many of you can identify in present-day Maharashtra what districts have been presented here? If you can see the images properly. You see a part is called Behrat. There is the central provinces, fairly large. Then you have the Nizam's dominion, Hyderabad. This is 1853 depiction of it. This is precisely when the annexation of Behrat has happened. And this is when the Nagpur, the Bosley of Nagpur, who died airless, and the British annexed it in the guard of a very cunning trick in the arms. Which Vidya am I talking about? Am I talking about a Berar, which is not so far away relative to the Berar of the Mahabharat, for instance, the Varad of the Mahabharat, or the Vidar of the Mahabharat? When I say Vidar, am I talking about central provinces? or I'm talking about Vena. But central provinces came about much later as an administrative unit. If you're aware of the region, which is with today, the 11 districts, there are two divisions, administrative divisions. One is the Nagpur division, and the other is the Amravati division. So if you put on a hat of a long theory thinker, you're saying, OK, so 200 years back, what was happening in this area? Because these present the districts were not there. You cannot find them on the map. They're constantly being restructured and reconfigured and redrawn. So what do you do to understand that? As a historian, you would go to documented history. You would go to the archives. You go to the gazettes of the different regions. You read the work of others, secondary materials, and so on. So I started doing that for the past three, four years, in fact, because this was a question I was always confused about as a PhD scholar. Why do I need to know about what was this region back in 1850? What was this region in 1861 in particular when central provinces was formed? What was this region in 1903 when central provinces and Bera was formed? Because I know that going back to the Brodenian argument, if these incidents, these events are going to have a long span or a long duration, I can connect the dots. And I say, if I have understanding of what happened in this region in 1853, then can I not answer some of the important questions about the crisis? It turned out, life is not that easy. Within that, there are dominions. This is the Nizam's dominion. And the light green part you are seeing is Berat, which is also known as Hyderabad assigned districts. Then I started asking, what was the Nizam doing in Berat? I never thought that the Nizam, in fact, strongly influenced the policies about agriculture in Vera. But I would be proved wrong because I was ignorant in my early days. When I started 
going over the literature, I realized that there are not too many important or so-called seminal literature in that context. Very few scholars looked into this question. More still, there are very few economists who bothered about this. And then I started saying, let me start doing a good analysis, a relatively good analysis of the political history. I must tell you that Broder was against writing political history because you're just talking about who was the king, who killed whom, what sort of struggles happened, what was the dynamic, and all that. I started doing that after the Buddhist influences grew in that region, but for today's presentation, I'm going to start with the 13th century history, very briefly, the last Hindu kingdom that had influence over that region, the Yadava kingdoms or the Yadava dynasty, on whom Alauddin Khalji and the Khaljis and the Delhi Sultanate had a lot of influence in their marauding towards Telangana and south of India, the Deccan or the Dakhin as we know it. Then came the influence of the Delhi Sultanate over the years. The Bahamani Sultanate came out as a fallout of the structures that were formed because of the power struggle and the political issues there. Nijam Shahi was also an important aspect. This is when the Deccan is getting formed. I'm still talking about a chronological time, which, which is not good as per the precept of the Rodillian school or the Angle school. Just you know, don't talk about chronological history. That is what the journalists do. That is what the scribblers do. And in that sense, what is wrong in doing a chronological history? That, that's how I'm starting to be a bit more counterintuitive in my arguments. I'm saying, well, I'll follow this school of thought, but I also define the prescriptions of the school of thought. So for several years, I started piecing together the chronology that helped me think through this region, yes, and so on. But I saw that not many are talking about the influence of the gold kings, the Rajkons and the several other factions within the gold kingdoms. In fact, Nagpur was established by the one king. The Mughals were in the scene. They had a very interesting interaction with the Gonds as well as others. In fact, just to give you a factoid here, the founder of Nagpur, does anybody know who founded Nagpur? Bulan Shah. Bakht Bulan Shah. Very good. So Bakht Bulan Shah became a little bhakt of Aurangzeb. And then in his later years, because of the local political dynamics, he had a fallout with Aurangzeb. And Aurangzeb changed his name to Nagun Bhakt, like the cursed one. Such interesting pieces will hit you in your face when you start reading those histories, but you'll say, I'm in search of structures, and structures are not visible. They may not have been written about in a manner that you can
sharp declining area for BT and the yield of BT in the last 4 to 5 years. So BT yield advantages are not holding good. Farmers are continuing their struggle with descaling and performance anxiety is still very important in this context. There are multiple seed varieties they are experimenting with. In one year, you see these are some of the talukas where farmers are even experimenting with five seeds, four seeds. But on an average, they experiment with two seeds. But if those two seeds are changing seasonally, the descaling is still a major concern. And we are also seeing that the number of plots in which multiple brands are utilized <laughs> is coming up. A related issue of cocktails in pesticides that we observed in the past six, seven years, and we have written about it, that is also interesting. They are getting their extension information from the seed dealers, from the input dealers. So they are mixing multiple concoctions. There's a health hazard issue that we've also documented. They are trying their best to get the most of it. But that long theory, as we saw, is now slowly acting against them. The soil fertility issues have come up. Issues of health hazard is part in 2017, 18, you might have heard about pesticide poisoning cases in the other world. Then you realize that there's a regulatory issue there. I believe now the crisis is there across the supply chain and the value chain. But how that broader global structure continues to bother the farmers is what I'm going to focus on for the rest of my life. So the idea there is, when I was doing my postdoctoral research, my advisor, Nixon said that the secret to a good longitudinal study is start young and hope that you live long. One thing I have gotten correct, the other I beat the pandemic. So I believe being a Bayesian updater, I still have a good chance of having a fairly long longitudinal study in that sense. So what we see is that the long theory has informed us about all these issues I talked about. The importance of these long-term structures is emerging from engagement with the long theory. There are several dimensions of how this has informed our understanding of crisis and weather and how has this longitudinal study helped us? It has helped us in a broader theoretical context. We are able to identify the hypothesis that we are unable to identify. We are even testing some of the hypotheses. Many of these are already published. We understand and acknowledge the complex systemic interactions. We understand that there are measurement issues in both yield. Measurement issues in income is very important in rural studies and also the importance of ethnography and qualitative research is something we have spent time on. Several practical issues, that in itself could be a talk. How do you motivate the field investigators, your team in the village, the politics that plays out, the dynamics, the relationship issues and so on. Team attrition is a challenge and more or less we are not institutional scholars in that sense, we represent ICRISAD or some other organization. We are just two faculty from institutes in India we try to bootstrap our times and hope there are grants to help us out and Rahul you have ditched us. So hoping that in the future Rahul will come back to work in our longitudinal studies but he has contributed a lot in validating the data. And in fact thanks to the help of Rahul and other scholars and researchers who have worked with us. So a forthcoming book based on the broader long theory arguments and accidents in history as well as the findings from longitudinal studies till 2021 will be published in this book called Accidental Gamblers, Risk and Vulnerability in Withered Cotton to be published by the Cambridge University Press. So thanks a lot for your time and I'll be reachable on this email ID. Otherwise you can walk to Storm and we can have a chat. Thank you all. If there are any questions. Yeah, thanks, thanks.
as the business fairly straightforward. So there are capitalists investing in mills in England. They want to get the raw materials, which is raw cotton, at the cheapest price. So how do you get that? You lobby with the government. And then in the British India, you have the Raj, it goes 1857. So 1858 onwards, you have access to a lot of administrative machinery. The railway investments have taken place. The transportation costs are globally one of the most competitive. So there was profitability to be had. So when the supply shock took place, you know, it happened in 1861. So there was a cotton famine in England. So in New England, North America, Eastern Coast, a lot of cotton mills were also coming up. They also started having a lot of issues, but more in Lancashire area of England. And that's if you go to Manchester, so the traders are affected, then you're saying the dealers are affected. So everybody wants to have this cotton. After all, the American Civil War, there was something called the King Cotton Diplomacy. So one of the reasons the American Civil War played out the way it did was because of the overconfidence of the southerners or the confederates in the ability of cotton to negotiate with the north. So when they had some sort of blockages or the blockades took place for supply to England, that's when the war broke out. And in fact, uh, two American presidents at that point and over the next few years were plantation owners, right? And in England, much earlier compared to the US, there's a lot of anti-colonial, in fact, there's anti-slavery kind of offensive uh, right? So they wanted to understand that can we really win this war? So in fact, a lot of people argue that the King Cotton, you know, and by the time in the Indian context, we understood that a white gold, because it's given you that sort of profits. Cotton financed Bollywood's predecessors back then. In fact, there's a lot of estimates as to Bombay would not have been Bombay had it not been for the American Civil War. But uh, I can discuss about the determinism later, but the broader issue is, that you have to improve the supply at cheap costs and the scale and the volumes have to be taken care of. So that's why it was important and it was the capitalists who were financing it. and the role of the labor relations. In fact, I recommend uh, reading Chandrakar's book, Sharan Chandrakar's book, because you understand in Bombay's cotton capitalism, what were the relations between production and labor? There were migration patterns, demographic changes I didn't talk about for the brevity of time here, but you realize that at some point, why did Vidarva become the center of the cotton capitalism? Why did the Empress Mill investments fail? You know, even they had access to cheap coal and cheap water in that sense. That's a locational decision. But because of the transportation advantages and the economies of scope that the Bombay ports offered, it was easier for Bombay to flourish and the other centers. But there are changes over time. It's not that it's a static description. At some point, Nagpur had its chance, but then the other factors militated against it. And that's in fact a very interesting work that Jaydeep Hardikar has undertaken is writing about uh, Nagpur of the 1861 to 1870s, where the imprisonment had come in, where the labor were coming from, what is the role of migrant workers, and so on. So that's where you have to go back to understanding of capitalism, and there are schools of thought in understanding global capitalism, imperialism, and its role in the growth and decline of cotton. Yes. Sven Beckert's work is also very important, the empire of cotton. Yeah, I'll add one point here. I don't understand the way the Cotton mills work, yeah. but when Gumshed, he actually started the Empress Mill, and then there was this model mill, and he was actually ridiculed by all industrialists because it's a dry place. Yeah. And apparently, you need a lot of moisture, a little bit atmosphere sure. for all cotton mills. So he had, in fact, that time said that you know I would put the humidifiers. That I have not visited the mills. I always used to go past it, but I don't know if they used to use humidifiers to bring the humidity to a certain level. 
but then Bombay naturally had to do it. Well, that great. Might be, uh, sure. In addition, in fact, now that you mentioned the model mills versus investment, so JRD Tata invested in innovations. So there was a technology called Ring Frames, which he sent one of the experts to the US to understand that. He came back and applied that. But that saved a lot of money, but still there are other factors that affected them. The resource constraints played out, but Nagpur did not evolve to be an important center for the cotton transport on the railway networks also. So that's been talked about. But then post Bhusawal Junction, if you recall that map, you'll see that anything that's diversifying to the west, so Amravati retained its structures for cotton production, then Goldana continued to be an important market. In fact, uh, that cover of the book, so that's depicting Khanga. So that's saying how important a center was it. And one of our, correct. And a lot of uh, cases uh, have also uh, been observed in the sense that uh, some of the administrative decisions, if any of you are interested in trying to understand the upstream factors of decision making, in what meeting, what was said, whatever is documented, I'd be happy to share the archival references with all of you. So the Bombay, the Maharashtra Legislative Assembly archives in Bombay will have a lot of documentation on the trade part of it. So the Nagpur archives, has in Vidarbha archives still have a lot of documentation in terms of not the trade but in terms of the investments in railways, local markets. I have not presented it here. I have also analyzed the prices and wage and the relative prices with respect to food prices in, in large uh, detail or uh, in the sense that when you read the book, uh, this is not a book talk though, so at some point you will realize that uh, that long diary also helps you understand the challenges in documenting the past series. You know, it's not so easy to come up. There are also contestations in the literature. So that's the challenge in historical research or economic history. And then the biases that are underlying some of the depictions of what you're reading. Do you want to ask? Yeah. 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 Do you have the ingredients for something? Uh, no, uh, yeah. we come back. Yeah. yeah. We come back. Please. So I just have one question. I have yeah, one question. I'm Rokesh and I'm Professor in I just have one question at this point. This talk is basically what are the Gujarat farmers doing in trade? They seem to try and in fact, there are, you know, the Gujarati farmers telling the Vidarbha farmers, you know, we are getting it all wrong and we are so happy with the Yeah. So what exactly is it like, you know, the traditional social issues which I am very aware of in Vidarbha, you yeah. know, about you know, not being very industrial. Right. I was also fortunate to study Saurashtra from 2009 to 11. There are three factors that are important. One is the way the irrigation systems worked out. The second is Gujarati farmers started BT cotton sowing much earlier than it was commercialized. This whole idea of stem seeds and the irrigated uh, cotton factors interacted. So the illegal seeds from Gujarat actually saw the yields rising and by the time rest of India was adopting and the pest infestation, that ecology itself was changing, Gujarat was relatively protected. But yes, thirdly, the social factors played a role in terms of uh, the kind of cotton that was grown, the breeding infrastructure that was there in Gujarat, and the quality advantages. But now, still we see plateauing of yields after almost 20 years of using those illegal or stealth seeds. So there's a very interesting contrast of Saurashtra and Vidhar. In fact, that I'll be happy to share with you. Some of the factors, yeah. yeah somebody who had a hand up there. Priyanka, you wanted to ask? Yeah. Decisions are being made, keeping the launch duty in in mind. Uh, yeah, so very good question. So the first part you realize that uh, who is desperate or who is suffering, who is struggling. So we've also documented upward mobility and downward mobility over that 14, 13 and a half years that we've studied, in the longitudinal sense. But we've also understood the sort of scholarship that is there, no matter how limited. Having talked about. Can you sustainably grow even if you're having enough cash, but your commons are depleted? So Lakshmandi Satya has written much about it. If your wastelands are getting depleted, your fodder economy is in a crisis. So the answer is, 
though there is a sense of despair whenever the prices crash, all farmers know that cost of cultivation is going up. Our non-withered research we have established that that's a fact that we have to deal with now and then put pressure on the policy makers to work out interventions and in sustainable policies. But the broader context is, are they able to situate themselves in the broader crisis? The answer is there's some normalization that has happened, but we've also seen a very important question being asked, why wither farmers are not protesting to the extent that you saw in Punjab or other parts? So what is that larger agrarian change question, where the question of resistance of the farmers, the rebellion of the farmers, so there we are engaging with something called the moral economy, not necessarily just from the Scots framework, but then you try to understand there are caste and class dynamics here that plays out differently compared to the rest of Maharashtra. And the political influences have so far not been that emphatic. And in terms of the chief ministers from Maharashtra or from Maharashtra who are from Vidhar, you realize that whenever they have been chief ministers, they have completed a term. That, that, that's, an, that's a factoid. So there are other pressures, the sugar barons or the political economy of sugarcane. And the second question, simply put, yes, but then the sort of prescriptions you're having for your long durial forecasting horizons, we're not going to bet on that. But we're saying, can we acknowledge the importance of long-term structures and try to see what Fanan broadly called as the scars of events. He said there is no society in the world where events don't leave a scar. How deep are the scars is for scholars to figure out. Does that answer your question? Oh. I, I just come yeah. Excellent presentation. Uh, my interest is BP Cotton, uh, Monsanto, Glyphosate. Monsanto been taken over by bears who produce um, all the farmers. So there is a big nexus. Uh, just to, to yeah. talk about capitalism, yeah. right? Uh, now, are we doing any study on health issue of uh, glyphosate being used for this BT cotton? But glyphosate is a roundup, right. which is a weed killer, right? Yeah. Uh, and there are many complications of glyphosate, like cancer, um, you know, autism, no one, like thousands of them. One of them is depression. Uh, also, using this BT cotton in a crop, like I always say cotton, uh, Complications of uh, you know those uh, you know pesticides and weed killer and clothes that we wear. And how about the um, how about organic cotton? I mean, are we looking at uh, growing organic cotton? How is is it feasible? So yeah, so great, great question. Thanks for people. So there are two parts to it again. So if you talk about uh, this broader glyphosate and HTBT, which is again grown illegally, it's not been commercialized. It's no approval, but farmers are using it. When we ask farmers, they have interesting stories about how they went on a scooter to get it from Telangana, smuggled it to Bidar and so on. So time and again, the agriculture department has conducted its raids and there is understanding, it's widespread. But farmers of late have also realized that the health effects are not just for them, it's also for those pesticide sprayers, mostly agriculture workers. But then there's also a cultural pattern you will see, not just in other other places, that the labors are better off than us, and we are worse off. So that ethos is also prevalent. So one has to understand that yes, there is potential association with depression or mental health issues. In fact, that has been a kind of question that has popped up many a times. And in fact, if uh, there are interests in terms of conducting studies in that direction, I'll be happy to discuss. But the broader challenge about uh, organic cotton, again, uh, I have interacted with several NGOs that initiated organic cotton plantation, non pesticide management, integrated pest management and all. Over a period of time, they have abandoned those, mostly citing access to raw materials or labor issues. But it's been a challenge. So the certification issues aside, you, it's, there's also a very ironic aspect to it. You see that there is a Subhash Palikar Padhat that is coming in the weather context as well, but then farmers gossip about it being useless, right? So they could uh, pay to attend some of the seminars of having these sort of uh, practices or mixed farming initiatives, but slowly certain pockets, particularly the educated youth who are getting back to agriculture, we see they're willing to experiment with these alternative forms. 
but there is hope. You know? Even uh, CIC or Nagpur is experimenting with certain desi cotton varieties, but they experiment with uh, desi BT hybrid strain. So there's a lot of science, technology, and society aspect that one could engage. Hello, sir. I'm Preeti. I'm BBA first year. Thank you for the presentation. It was great learning for us. So, sir, my question is like how the cult, uh, this cotton cultivation has so, uh, socially and economically impacted the people from Vidarbha region and especially the women. How it has changed. Although in agriculture it looks that like it's, uh, it's the domain of men only but in many activities women are involved. So then my question is how especially it has impacted the women life? Great question. So I didn't talk about it in detail but you recall there was a labor set of surveys that we've been conducting for the past three years. So there's a clear gender division of labor, particularly sewing and weeding and picking. You see that women are actively coming forward and the non-farm opportunities for women are very limited in rural with that. So even though there's a lot of investment happening in highways and physical infrastructure, you know, so we haven't witnessed, at least in the study regions, that women, despite their education, had moved out to higher paying wages, to our regular salaries, and that's in fact what Rahul is currently working on. He's studying social networks in Vidar, trying to understand that whether migration to some of these service-oriented or white-collar jobs has in fact taken place to the extent expected. But overall, the background is in India, there's a decline in female labor force participation. One out of five women are actually in the workforce now of that working age population. Mm -hmm. So you have to tackle those social and economic realities. So there's another student, Raiz, who just graduated. His thesis was on that, that despite education, why women in particular rural in India are unable to come out of it. But having said that, cotton absorbs the most labor in that belt because it is not only labor intensive, the BT cotton varieties have resulted in multiple pickings. Earlier they would pick, let's say, two times, they are picking three to four times. And since the crops are on the plot still, let's say, January, I haven't seen in February, that's complicating the pink boldworm issue. So the advisory of the scientists and the expert is do not have cotton on the fields after December. But since there is this hope of greater yields, because of one more round of picking, farmers are waiting for a month or so. So that is worsening the issue. And women are definitely affected because of these interactions. But that's something which is also assuring them certain returns as a farm laborer. So if you're a farmer owning land, let's say around four and a half or five acres, your women are still working on the farms of others because there is a supply of labor and that's going to meet the demand that is coming from BT cotton and the other crops. Sir, one question. Like in India, there is less ownership of agriculture by women. Yeah. So how about the no, no, it's, it's not uh, different. So you realize that there are a few, in fact, uh, 8 to 9 percent of our sampled households are women headed households. Why are they women headed households? Very likely they're widows or they're separated from the husband, and those social norms are still intact. You realize there's some change in attitudes. In fact, uh, one of the students from Sitara, you know, Vikas, so who's been, uh, is a founder of Rutag, Swansuit Projects, and then Ruka Technologies. He has set up a unit in one, one neighborhood of our study village, and that unit of women entrepreneurs won, won an award. So the idea is if you have some sort of engagement where women have that autonomy and agency, and there's returns to that effort, I think it is still going to have some potential going forward. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Satish Agniyoti, uh, teaching in Sitara. Uh, my question relates to, I mean, the uh, scars of uh, that this society has on historical events that will have certain depth. The question that comes in is, are we not able to mitigate or overcome that depth of the scar or, or height of the bump, as we call it? My uh, field uh, interactions limited in Vidar. When you talk to the farmers about these suicides in particular, there is one answer which comes across very commonly, ki wherever there is zor dhanda, that means a, a altered additional source of income, farmers don't commit suicide even if there is a cotton crisis. 
and and uh, number of farmers when you ask them what zordanda is typically cattle and you are told that that cattle kind of works as an insurance so if you have sold my cattle that's the first warning signal then suicides will eventually come now this being the case intercropping is not working out okay so uh, is is there a possibility of overcoming that scar and and when he talked about the laid back nature of the with the people and that's exactly when varadi man so she laid back as that so but is there not a way of getting over it rather than flogging the cotton itself yeah. i will just add one yeah, sure. so, so the reason which you are talking about let me recall the piece piece arrow is a completely different uh, crop uh, pattern than that you know of course uh the west wither by is also incidentally where the orange is grown it's not grown in the east eastern part and so do they also have because oranges are orchards and in between do they grow cotton and then yeah. basically have two crops right i just quickly answer your question come back to the study in fact uh, last month i was in nagpur agriculture department getting data on insurance for the horticulture crops for what are there were only four takers of that insurance for nagpur there not many either in fact the non doni farmers are relatively showing the smaller farmers they're showing interest if they have access to drip irrigation or irrigation infrastructure in some projects so the watersheds have resulted in impactful structures so the aquifers and so on it's been rejuvenated so they are showing interest but it's still in a mess what is happening is if in the sample less than 2% and have traveled around the region hardly there is a village where more than 15 20% are investing in horticulture crops there's also this issue of market linkages so the role of apos and others have been talked about but nagpur area is a nagpur division which is not in varda so there you have greater investment again chandrapur and gachiroli gondia bandara you are not going to see that because of the paddy plant and other issues but the best still hope that you able to diversify on farm as well as off the farm non farm in kind of diversification which is a very slow painful access to non farm uh, there uh, i would still acknowledge the rarity of suicides in a wizard village if you're talking about a village of let's say 5000 or 6000 population in a cluster of villages there we see 5 to 10 suicides over that 4 to 5 year period so rarely you see that one or two of them could be attributed to agrarian factors and so on and the farmers also acknowledge and recognize the challenges in convincing the administration that this is a farm related suicide so if there is if the data on the collectors website we'll see that nearly half of the cases are trashed as not being a farm related suicide so they are not going to give the compensation which was stopped earlier now it is resumed the issue is in my understanding that the cultural aspects not many people have really investigated there is some understanding yes variations across eastern weather and western weather happen the migration patterns need to be studied you know, in the sense that despite education why would the youth from western weather not migrate to amravati nagpur or as far as bombay for jobs it's improved over that 13 year 14 year that i have studied the migration stories are improving but these are low paying casual jobs only 10% rahul if i'm not wrong is in the regular wage set for these study villages so the idea there is what can the state do what can the markets do is going to be an important question going forward but yes everybody understand that ability to absorb the shocks the income shocks because of that and wherever there is access to irrigation the rabi crops are also providing income support so i'm mostly talking about the korodahu or the lashli the rain fed the pure rain fed farmers non cattle and cattle economy in this small ruminant segment is going up not in in the sense of uh, cattle as we know of in other parts but livestock is mostly goats and it is for the local markets poultry packet poultry is there but we are seeing that change over time so in fact brickens are an important source of in incomes for the farmers themselves so able to lease it out to others but then the local workers from the village economy are not supplying them these are migrants from chandrapur gachiroli and other places so we will talk about that this question how do these suicides not compare with the 18th century suicide 
Yeah. Yeah, so there is some work that uh, Morris and others have you know, indicated that the idea there is we have difficulty in attributing that, let's say it's 14 per 100,000, 14 per lakh in the last 4 to 5 years. So then it would be, to, to my recollection, it's around 1 to that. But the migration, because of this distress in the farm, is well documented. So the follow up question is why are they not migrating? But rather, yes, so there I will invoke a bit of the Dutch human estrangement, individualization, the social processes uh, there on. But uh, yes, we have a witness that individualization, we are documenting that. There's uh, sociological changes that have uh, been talked about. B.B. Mohanty, for instance, have done uh, very interesting work here. And we are trying to understand that, uh, going back to the question that Priyanka asked, that if I have to predict about the future, I would rather be in that individual time layer in my prediction, not in the long term in that sense. Uh, I, I had a question. Uh, I mean, methodologically, uh, also for instance, you have been interacting with Sitara. So, what are your reflections on the possibilities, on the gaps, uh, on, on the on the need perhaps, yes, but, you know, in an MTech project of six months or eight months as against a PhD project. So, if I may say some advice or some thoughts or some reflections, in the Sitara context, but also say an institute like IIT, yeah. what is uh, going forward? I mean, if I was to put it differently, how do we make, how do we do more of this? So what would you? Right. Yeah. So a great question. Thanks, Pandu. So there are two parts to it. The first is that there are technology problems uh, that would be of interest for students in Sitara to engage with. I'll give an example. Cotton continues to be a labor-intensive crop. And the cropping patterns and the padhat or agronomic practices are catering to that. The intercropping is making sure that the bullocks would pass through it during the dorin process or the interculture process. And there is still no mechanization of cotton picking or harvesting in the common sense. So it is still a manual labor job and the gender interactions are emerging from there. CIRCOT, who is the kind of research center for technology in cotton, based in Mumbai, they have experimented with some designs of harvesters, small cotton harvesters. So if that is of interest, then I believe that something could be taken up. Then the sustainability issues around the watersheds as well as some of the Chaldiv Shiva kind of yojanas that there is mixed evidence on based on our studies could also be examined. And if you see there are government's initiatives in each of these regions, in each of these districts, any evaluation that is scientifically informed, I would encourage our students to participate in that. And studies of this nature will also inform your research in other contexts in Maharashtra and India, but also in the sense that you, you are most welcome to participate in the future rounds, help us design the questions that be of importance to you, and I'll be happy to collaborate and discuss with you going forward. And the last point, you know, I, I did not refer to these as my villages. So when I was doing my postdoctoral research, I had a tendency to say Palankur is my village. So this is what, as if the scholar or the researcher is owning a village. It is everybody's village, it's democracy after all. So you are most welcome to visit, have interactions with Rahul, me, and look at our data. I'll be happy to share the data with all of you, play around with it. So at an analytical level also, apart from the technology, society, science interface, they could engage with us. Thanks. So go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Uh, a fantastic, uh, very lucid, and I think that is the reason why there are so many curiosity questions. Yeah. I also have a few, but uh, I restrain myself and go back to your main longevity. I may not be making a correct pronunciation. Uh, I saw the list uh, at the end, I don't remember the exact subtitle. But there were few factors you listed there, okay? And if we are talking about explanation to be arrived through longevity, uh, when they see the list, it is quite comprehensive in its coverage, substantively, and it's quite eclectic. So if we are talking about explanation that is parsimonious, uh, how would you go from there, okay? Because you are trying to cover substantively broad because geological, individual, political, you know, substantively very broad these things.
but you are not trying to uh, collapse them in categories. So how would you handle that? Because say, when I saw that list, I just said, okay, why not we see it in terms of dialectic materialism? Except that uh, environmental dimension, everything will fit in the relations of production, changing relation of production. So what about this logiduri? Will it help us to come up with a very parsimonious, still comprehensive explanation? Yeah, thanks. So that's a great question. In fact, that's also been the critic of the framework. So one aspect here is that if you are seeking a parsimonious explanation or maybe an oversimplistic uh, reductionism in some context, the idea there is we, we actually do not need this frame of thought because after all it's a very difficult and lengthy engagement with the materials and the arguments. But now coming to this point, how does that really inform your arguments? Are we really trying to figure out long term structures in whether society, in the production relations and some comments about the cultural connotations came up, that's something one starts engaging with. But now talking about a dialectical materialism or let's say one a Marxist interpretation, one is most welcome to engage in what is the periodization that Brodel has talked about. That yes, I broadly feel that having a 300 year landscape of history is great, but let's not ignore that 10, 15, 23 or 25 year old change that's also informing our context, the question that was Adniyoti rightly kind of indicated in this question is that have you not figured out the way out of the crisis? Over these generations of farmers, generations of bureaucrats, scholars and so on, are we just interested in documenting that change playing out? So in, in, in a more simplistic uh, term, I would say that this is going to be a challenge engaging in long theory. Because I'm also imposing my understanding of whether society and the production relations and the climatic changes. I didn't present those analysis which have been done in the background now. We take in, so it's like all the departments and disciplines coming together. And then what Broadwell called as a total history. You know, we should not delete some aspects or dimensions, try to make, but that's the challenge. Then you can't just be an archaeologist and a geographer and a water specialist for everything. You're just an economist who started up understanding the historical aspects. But that's, that, that's a great point of reconciliation also. You're trying to see that, now let us talk about the nutritional challenges in Vida. Because of these changes, do we see those challenges? When you go to nutritionindia.info, we see that Yavatmal and Vardha are not comparable for some reason. We see that the cropping patterns and change the dietary diversity and the kind of incidents or the manifestations we are interested in. But I haven't looked at it. I believe some researchers from here, other places would be happy to. But I'll be uh, happy to really respond to that in a more detailed sense in some form and we can discuss that. Thank you for the great question. I'll try to be close with that. And there is one last guide question. Yeah. Uh, burning question, sorry. Sure. And all these references that are given, I'll share with uh, Professor Pankaj or the team. So please share with everybody. And if you have any doubts, I'll be happy to discuss. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.